Good evening and welcome to Crossroads Baptist Church. I'm Pastor Dan. Today is May 23rd, 2021. And uh, we are looking at the doctrinal statement of our church. And uh, this evening we're going to talk about uh, the doctrine of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, as we do this, um, it's, it's good for us to remember that as with the, the doctrine of God the Father that we talked about last week, our church doctrinal statement act, actually does not have one specific statement on God the Son. It doesn't have one specific statement on our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, by the way, that's called the doctrine or the theology of Christology. Christology, the study, the study of Christ. So our doctrinal statement doesn't have one particular point um, that talks about Christ. Now there are statements in our uh, doctrinal positions that talk about the virgin birth, which um, was a huge issue when this uh, doctrinal statement was first crafted. Um, but there are particular statements about the virgin birth. There's a particular statement about the resurrection and priesthood of Christ. And then there's various phrases throughout uh, many more of our points of doctrine that mention Jesus Christ. But there's no one statement that brings all these things together, that brings everything into one statement that we believe about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now, I don't think anybody would argue that uh, we should not be as specific as possible about what we believe about our Lord Jesus Christ. And so in, in this lesson here this evening, we're going to talk about what would be a good statement concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. What, what would be a good statement for us to uh, include in our doctrinal statement that would sort of sum up the things that we believe about the Lord Jesus Christ. And remember, we can't be exhaustive, but we have to be uh, representative here. So I think there's seven things, uh, there's at least seven things, that should be included in a statement about uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. So number one, we need to include that he is fully God and fully man. So he's both God and man. He's 100% God, 100% man. Number two, that he's the eternal son of God. In other words, he doesn't become the son of God in some way. He has always been uh, the son of God. Number three, that he was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of a virgin. So that's important. That's related to his uh, humanity, to him being fully man. Number four, that he's the Messiah of Israel. He's the head of the church and he's the savior of the world. We need to say something about that. Uh, number five, we need to talk about the atonement, that he died for the sins of uh, the world. So his atoning sacrifice, we need to talk about that. Number six, uh, his resurrection, that he was raised from the dead and has ascended back to the Father. So in this, we talk about his uh, resurrection, his ascension, and his present work of intercession. And number seven, uh, that he will return. So we need to talk about the return. So uh, that's that's basically the seven aspects that I think we ought to include in any statement about our Lord Jesus Christ. And here's, here's just a quick suggestion. This isn't uh, meant to be perfect in any way. I'm sure it could be uh, developed a little, a little bit more. Maybe there's things that aren't out uh, uh, as a part of it that should be a part of it, but um, uh, read this and see what you think about it. I'm, I'm going to read it. You follow along. We believe that our Lord, that the Lord Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, is both fully God and fully man, that he is the eternal Son of God, that being conceived by the Holy Spirit, he was born of the Virgin Mary that he is the Messiah of Israel, the head of the church, the Savior of the world, that he died on the cross in our place for our sin, that he was raised physically from the dead on the third day and has ascended back to the Father and now is at his right hand making intercession for the saints, 
and that he will come to receive his church to himself and then return physically to the earth to restore the nation of Israel and to establish his kingdom in Jerusalem. So that's not too long of a statement, but it's got a lot of stuff packed in there. And so now I just want to look at an explanation and support for the different aspects of this statement. And so these are different things we just need to understand about uh, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So first, understand, um, understand him as being fully God and fully man. Jesus as fully God and fully man. Here's, here's how I put it in the statement. We believe that the Lord Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, is both fully God and fully man. So take, let's take a look at this. Uh, first, what passages prove that Jesus is fully God? Well, here's just some of them. All right, there's many that we could refer to, but here's some of them. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. And again, we're talking about the aspect of Jesus' deity, of, of him being God. And, and it says in here, For unto us is a child is born, unto us a son is given. The government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So it, he, his name is Mighty God. So this is referring to the Messiah here, who is Jesus Christ, Jesus the Messiah, and he, he is called Mighty God. That's Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. But then we have John 1.1. 1, 1. Gospel of John 1.1, 1, 1, which says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word was God. That's a good, a good thing to underline in your Bible. Also, we see Colossians 2.9. Colossians 2.9. By the way, I should say, um, you probably shouldn't try to keep up with me flipping in your Bible to these places, but uh, just write down, if you're taking notes, you should write down something for this point, Jesus is fully God and fully man, and then just write the scriptures down, and then you can go back and look them up, because you're not going to have enough time to uh, flip in your Bible. But Colossians 2, 9, it says, for in him, talking about in Jesus Christ, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So all the fullness of the Godhead is in Jesus Christ. Uh, Titus chapter 2, verse 13. Looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our great, he's called our great God. Then Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. It says, who being in the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, referring to Jesus' relationship to God the Father, the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person. It's expressing that Jesus is God. Then in uh, verse 8 of that same chapter, it says this, But to the Son, talking about Jesus, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. So the Son is called God. Then finally, in uh, 1 John chapter 5, verse 20, it says this, And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we may know him who is true, and we are in him who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true and he, this is the true God and eternal life. So it's, it's connecting Jesus Christ to being the true God. So uh, we can say that the Lord Jesus Christ is fully God. But we also must understand he is fully man. Again, a passage we've already looked at, but Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. Remember how it starts? For unto us a child is born unto us a son is given now here's the thing about humanity every single person who has ever existed with the exception of two adam and eve has been born this is the common denominator in humanity it is birth not everybody's going to die 
There's some people who will be raptured. There's some people who God has taken, uh, but they didn't die. But everyone is born. And so when it says a child is born, a son is given, this is expressing his humanity. He's a child, a son. Uh, secondly, we see in Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, it says, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son. Again, child and son. Um, now, this is a verse we can use for the, the virgin birth. But just notice here, the emphasis is on shall bear a child and son. So, to be born is to be human, is to be man. Uh, then, uh, John chapter 1, verse 14, it says, And the Word became flesh. Again, expressing the humanity of Jesus Christ. And then in Galatians 4, 4, it says this, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law. So again, born of a woman, that's expressing the, the humanity of Jesus Christ, that he was fully man. So, so Jesus is fully God and fully man. In theological language, we call this the hypostatic union. The hypostatic union. You spell that H-Y-P-O-S-T-A-T-I-C. Hypostatic union. And this is talking about the joining of divinity and humanity. Now, how can divinity, God, be joined to humanity? So how this can be and how this ha actually happened is a mystery to us. We're not told. But the fact that it is and that it has happened is revealed to us in the Word of God. So we trust the Word of God when it says that this is true. So uh, Jesus as fully God and fully man, well, su well supported in the Bible. Now, Jesus as the eternal Son of God. Here's a statement. We believe that he is, talking about Jesus, is the eternal Son of God. Let me give you some passages here. First, John 3, 16, then John 20, 21. And I just want you to notice this comes from both ends of the Gospel of John. So you remember what it says in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. So God, and this is talking about the Father, gave his Son. Gave his Son. His Son, uh, Jesus didn't become the Son of God. God gave the Son. Uh, then in chapter 20, verse 21, it says this. So Jesus said to them again, Peace, peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. So again, the Father has sent Jesus, the Son. So the, the Son is actually sent. It wasn't the second person of the Trinity, so to speak, that was sent, but it was the Son that was sent. Um, here's another passage, Galatians 4, verses 4 through 5. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under law that we might receive the adoption as sons. So, uh, again, God sent forth his son. So when, when Jesus came to the earth to be born of a woman, he, God the Father was sending God the Son to do this. So he's been the son from eternity past. Then two more passages, 1 John 4, 10 and 14. 1 John chapter 4, verse 10. In this is love, that we loved, not that we loved the Father, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Verse 14. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. So what I want you to see in these passages is that Jesus did not become the Son at the Incarnation. He did not become the Son of God when he was born. These passages clearly show us that in eternity past, Jesus was, was the Son and, and the first person of the Trinity, 
God the Father was the Father. And so the Father and Son relationship between the first and second person of the Trinity goes back into eternity past. Um, there are some people who we would believe much like they do who, who get this wrong. And they believe that um, Jesus becomes the Son of God at the Incarnation. And that, that is incorrect. Okay, so let's go on to the next point. Here, here we have Jesus as conceived of the Holy Spirit and born of a virgin. Here's a statement. We believe that being, that being conceived by the Holy Spirit, he was born of the Virgin Mary. Let's look at this. Some of these uh, go together, of course, with some of the other passages that um, we have already referred to, but Let's think about being conceived by the Holy Spirit. Two passages here, Matthew 1, verse 18, and Luke 1, verse 35. Uh, Matthew 1, 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. She was found with child of the Holy Spirit. That's how she became pregnant, of the Holy Spirit. Then Luke chapter 1, verse 35. And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. And so, again, uh, Jesus is conceived by the Holy Spirit, and secondly here, he is born of the Virgin Mary. And of course, this is predicted in Isaiah 7, 14, which says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son. So the Old Testament predicts that the Messiah is going to come through a virgin. And then again, we have Matthew chapter 1, verse 18, but this time it, 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 we want to emphasize the fact that it says here, after his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, it says, before they came together, so before they were intimate, before they knew each other uh, physically, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. So uh, Mary was a virgin up through um, her, her delivery of Jesus Christ. So um, she didn't know a man until after Christ was born. Then Luke chapter 1, verse 34, it says this, Then Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I do not know a man? Again, she has had no relationship with a man. And so we have here taught in the Bible that Jesus was conceived of the Holy Spirit, conceived by the Holy Spirit, and born of a virgin, the Virgin Mary. Uh, the next point we're going to look at, this is our fourth point, and that is Jesus as the Messiah of Israel, the head of the church, and the Savior of the world. Now that's quite a bit to cover here in one bit of a statement, but that's what we want to do, because we believe he is the Messiah of Israel, he is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the world. So let's consider the fact that Jesus is the Messiah of Israel. Uh, the first passage to consider here is Matthew chapter 1, uh, verse 1. Uh, it, it, so, the, so the New Testament begins with these words. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. In other words, Jesus the Messiah. The word Christ is the word Messiah. So the book of the, the, the New Testament begins, the book of genealogy of Jesus the Messiah. So it's calling Jesus the Messiah right there. Uh, a little bit later on in Matthew chapter uh, 16, verse 16, it says this. Um, the context here is Jesus asking Peter, who do you say I am? Peter's answer, you are the Christ, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. So Jesus is the Messiah. Uh, then finally, we see here John 3, verse 28, which says, uh, You yourselves bear witness of me that I said, 
I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. Now, this is John the Baptist talking here. And he's telling these people, again, that he is not the Messiah. He's not the Christ. He's not the Messiah, but that he has been sent before the Messiah. And who does John the Baptist come before? He comes before Jesus. He is preparing the way uh, for Jesus. So uh, the Bible clearly teaches that Jesus is the Messiah of Israel. He is the promised Messiah. Uh, or, or let me put that in another way. He was the Messiah promised in the Old Testament. Now, what about head of the church? Two, two passages we can look at here real quickly. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 23, and then Colossians 1, 18. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 23. Three, it says this, for, for the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church. So Christ is referred to as head of the church. Then in Colossians uh, chapter 1, verse uh, 18, it says, And he, talking about Jesus, is the head of the body, the church. So clearly, Jesus is referred to as the head of the church. He is the the shepherd of the church. He leads the church. He is the authority over the church. The church is to submit to him in all things. So he's the Messiah. He's the head of the church. And finally, he's the savior of uh, the world. And um, undoubtedly, there should be no surprise that this comes from the Gospel of John. John chapter 4, verse 42. Then they said to the woman, Now we believe, not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard him, and we know that this is, is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. The Savior of the world. Now, 1 John chapter 4, verse 14. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. So Jesus is the Messiah of Israel. He's the head of the church, and he's the Savior of the world. By the way, Jesus, being the Savior of the world, was predicted in the Old Testament as well. I just didn't list those uh, passages here. So we see that the Bible clearly attributes to Jesus each of these positions, each of these uh, titles. Uh, fifthly, our fifth point that we want to look at here, I think this went right, yes, uh, Jesus as the substitutionary sacrifice for sin. Here's what we, th we believe. We believe that he, Jesus, died on the cross in our place for our sin. So he died as a substitute for us, as the sacrificial penalty uh, price for our sin. So several passages to consider here. 1 John 6, 51. John 6, 51. Jesus says, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh which I shall give for the life of the world. The life of the world. So Jesus gives his life for the world. He is paying the price for the sins of the entire world. He is a substitute for the, the sins of the entire world. Um, Romans chapter 5, verses 6 and 8. Romans chapter 5, verses 6 and 8. For when we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. He died for the ungodly. So he died in the place of the ungodly. Verse 8. But God demonstrated his own love toward us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So God or, or Christ died for us while we were sinners. He died for sinners. He's paying the penalty. Um, He's paying the, the price for our sin. Romans 8, 32. He who did not spare his own son, so this is talking about God the Father, not sparing God the Son, but delivered him up for us all. 
So again, that being delivered up it has the idea of Christ being delivered up to die for us. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, to be sin in our place. He took our sins upon himself. He, he was our substitute dying on the cross. And finally, Galatians 1.4 Who gave himself for our sins. So he died for our sins. He died in our place on the cross. So Jesus was the substitutionary sacrifice. He, was, he died on the cross in our place. While we should have been there dying for our sins, he died for our sins on uh, the cross. He paid the penalty, the just penalty, for sin when he died on the cross. Uh, number six now, uh, Jesus as to his uh, resurrection and uh, ascension. So this is what we believe about the resurrection and ascension. And um, as a part of this, his present work of intercession. Here's what we say in the statement, or here's what I said in the statement. We believe that he has raised, uh, that he was raised physically from the dead on the third day and has ascended back to the Father, and now is at his right hand making intercession for the saints. So let's look at the three parts of this, resurrection, ascension, and uh, intercession. So uh, resurrection. Again, in Matthew 28, 6. Um, this is when the women come to the garden. The one that they meet there says, He is not here, for he is risen. He's risen. So this is after the crucifixion when the women are gone to the tomb. And the angel appears and says, he's risen. In uh, Mark chapter 6, verse 16, he says the same thing. It says, but he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. So two times he is risen. And then again, in Luke 24, 6, it says the same thing. He is not here, but is risen risen. So again, Christ has been risen physically. Um, we can also see this in John 20 verses 19 through 20 and in verse 26. Now this goes on to show us that this resurrection was physical. It wasn't just some type of spiritual thing. It was, it was a physical thing. John 20, 19. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad that they saw the Lord. So they saw him physically. Verse 26, and after eight days, so this is eight days later, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas said, uh, and Thomas with them, Jesus came, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst, and said, Peace be uh, to you. So Jesus is with them physically. This is a physical resurrection. Then, of course, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 through 4, and verse 20. Verse 3, For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Rose again, past tense, the third day according to the Scriptures. Verse 20, But now Christ is risen from the dead, and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. In other words, Christ is the first one to be resurrected, and um, there's going to be those who are in Christ who follow him, who will be resurrected from the dead. So this is the resurrection, very clearly taught in the Bible. But we also see Christ's ascension, the ascension of Jesus. Acts chapter 1, verse 9, it says this, Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched him, talking about his disciples, he was taken up, as his ascension, and a cloud received him out of their sight. So Jesus is ascended. Um, uh, also Acts chapter 2, verse 33. 
Acts 2.33, therefore being exalted to the right hand of God, being exalted, being ascended to the right hand of God, he's ascended to the right hand of God, having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit. Okay, now chapter 7, verses 55 through 56. Now this is this is um, Stephen when he's being uh, killed, when he's being murdered, and he looks into heaven. So this is, this is the account here, verse 55. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, that Stephen being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, look, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. So Jesus has ascended back to the Father. And finally, we want to cover, too, in this, the present work of intercession, Christ's present work of intercession. Three verses here, Romans eight thirty four says this: Who is he who is who condemns? Who is he who condemns? Is it Christ who died and furthermore has also risen? Who is even at the right hand of the Father who makes intercession for us? In other words, Jesus doesn't condemn us since he's risen, he's been resurrected, he's ascended to the right hand of God, and now he makes intercession for us, and so we can't be condemned. He's interceding for us. Uh, Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25 says, Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for us. And this is talking about his present work of intercession. Then 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father. That's this intercessory work, an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So um, we believe all these things. The Bible teaches that Christ has been resurrected from the dead, that he's ascended to the right hand of the Father, and that his present work at the right hand of the Father is to make intercession. Now, the seventh and final point we're going to consider that we believe about Jesus is uh, Jesus as to his return. What we believe about Jesus as to his return here, this is what it says. Uh, we believe that he, talking about Jesus, will come to receive his church to himself and then return physically to the earth to restore the nation of Israel. Um, and to us, it should be, and to establish his kingdom in Jerusalem. So take out that second to the earth. And to establish his kingdom in Jerusalem. So uh, let's look. There's really two parts. There is the part here to receive the church, which we might call the rapture. And then the second part to restore Israel, restore the kingdom of Israel or the millennial kingdom to establish the millennial kingdom. So first part, to receive the church, just talking about the rapture. Uh, two, two verses, just two verses here. These aren't the only two verses, but these are the two verses I picked out that I think are clear. John 14, 3. Jesus tells his 11 disciples, And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. Not not come to you, I will receive you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. So Jesus is going to come again, he's going to receive them to himself, and then they are going to go to be with him. He's not coming to be with them, they are going to go to be with him. And then 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 17. Paul writes, but I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, those who have died, lest you sorrow as those who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will be raised first. They will be resurrected first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up. We shall be raptured together 
with them, so a group together with them, in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So the picture of this is the dead in Christ are resurrected. The, those who are alive in Christ still remain, you know, are raptured up together with those who have been resurrected up into the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So we are going to meet the Lord. The Lord comes part of the way. He descends part of the way, but he doesn't come to the earth. And he's partially descended. The believers are resurrected and raptured up to meet the Lord in the air, and then we're always with the Lord. So that's so that's Jesus coming to receive the church. The church goes to him. He doesn't come to the church. The second point is to restore Israel. Now you'll notice in the statement um, there in the blue that this this uh, restoration of Israel involves Jesus physically returning to the earth. So he's going to come to the earth physically, and he's going to restore the kingdom of Israel. Let me give you a couple passages here. Acts chapter 1, verse 6. It says, Therefore, when they had come together, so this is after Christ has been raised from the dead, he's with his disciples, when they had come together, they, the disciples, asked him, saying, Lord, Will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? So they are expecting the kingdom to be restored and that Jesus would reign over that kingdom. Um, Acts chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up and the cloud received them out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven, as he went up, let's talk about his ascension, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, "Men of Galilee, Galilee, who do you stand gaze? Excuse me, why do you stand gazing into heaven?" Now notice what they say: This same Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. So he's going to come back the same way he left, and this is talking about his return, not his coming to receive the church, but his return. To restore the kingdom. And he's going to come back to the earth. Um, Acts chapter 3 verses 19 through 21 also alludes to this same thing. So Peter has preached uh, in, in the temple. And uh, he comes to his, his challenge. He says, repent therefore and be converted. Talking to Jews. Talking to the Jews here. Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send Jesus Christ. So Jesus has already been sent, he's already died, he's already been resurrected, and he's already ascended to the Father. And now Peter is saying, repent and, be, uh, repent and be converted, that, the, that God may send back Jesus Christ, that Christ might return, who was preached to you before, whom heaven must receive until the time of the restoration of all things. So he's going to restore all things, including the nation of Israel. And this is going to happen when he returns. Then uh, Revelation 19, verses 11 through 16, record what this return looks like when Christ returns to the earth. Revelation chapter 19, verse 11. Now I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a, with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of, the, of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So this was the return of the Lord Jesus Christ to set up his kingdom, which will be set up in Jerusalem, on the throne of David, where he will rule not only over the nation of Israel, he's going he's gonna to rule over Israel, but he's going to restore Israel as the preeminent nation on the earth, 
and he will rule all over all of the other nations of the earth. So here we go, conclusion. In this brief study, we have not said everything that could be said about our Lord Jesus Christ. And we have only referenced a minuscule amount of scripture passages that refer to the Lord. But what we have done is to lay out a summary and, and in a representative way the major themes of the doctrine of Jesus Christ. And so here is that summary and representative doctrinal statement about what we believe about Jesus Christ. We believe that the Lord Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, is both fully God and fully man. That he is the eternal Son of God. That being conceived by the Holy Spirit, he was born of the Virgin Mary. That he is the Messiah of Israel, the head of the church, the Savior of the world. That he died on the cross in our place for our sin. That he was raised physically from the dead on the third day and has ascended back to the Father and is now at his right hand making intercession for the saints, and that he will come to receive his church to himself, and then return physically to the earth to restore the nation of Israel and to establish his kingdom in Jerusalem. So we look forward to the day when Jesus comes with the title, uh, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. God bless you as you serve him this week.